one single wondrous story of Jesus. When we all get to heaven, what a glorious day of rejoicing that will be. Now, come on. You need to sing it. Let's hear it. Okay, you're getting better. Um, okay, 205, not what have I gotten, but what I received. Only a sinner saved by grace. Let's hear it. Not have I got. Getting good, 123, I serve a risen saviour, he's in the world today. We're going to sing the first and the last verse, and then we'll sing because he lives after that, because it's, it's, it goes with it. So let's, let's hear it, okay.
lifted me, first and last verse, and sing, really lift the Lord up. Let's hear you. People of God said, Amen, and love lifted me. 103 this time, just as you're turning up the page and we're getting the uh, words on the screen, let me give you all a very warm welcome. Sincere thanks to your brother Alan for leading some community hymn singing, and you were singing very, very well. We really did enjoy that. And to those that are present here tonight, some who are visiting with us, we want to warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name, and also to those that are listening on the World Wide Web on Sermon Audio, on Facebook, on YouTube. Again, we warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name, and we thank you for joining with us for the encouragement you've been, the text messages, and the uh, WhatsApps, the emails, and the phone calls, and we do appreciate even some letters, and you've even sent me some theological books. Now, it doesn't mean that you're questioning my theology, you're trying to encourage my heart, and we do appreciate that, and we trust the Lord will richly bless you and your family. So to one and all, whether you're a regular worshipper or a visitor, we warmly welcome you in our Saviour's name. 103, we'll stand together as we sing, Have You Read the Story of the Cross? <clears throat> Amen. Let's all stand as we worship.
In my old church, I don't think you would have got that hymn finished. Someone else would have started. You see, we don't have the hymn book now, sometimes in the hand. And as a result of that, the words are on screen. They may go off quickly. And you might want to sing the third verse over, all over, but you're on the fourth. And you don't even know how it starts. But when you have the hymn book in your hand, and then you can see it. And uh, we've often said that if someone wanted to sing another verse of a hymn and the Lord leads you to do that, we'll not be stopping you. Now, we don't want you to do it all the time. Uh, we'll soon get a little tired of those things and you don't want you to sing every other verse again after we have sung it all. Uh, but certainly it does, I believe, when the Spirit of God is there, there's liberty and you feel free, you want to worship and that's always a good thing. So good singing and we do believe that's an indication of the presence of of the Lord with us. So let's still our hearts before the one who died an atoning death for thee. Our loving and our eternal Heavenly Father, we take these few moments just to still our hearts before thee to acknowledge that thou art God. We know, Lord, that as we enter into thy courts, we stand before one who dwells in light inaccessible hid from our eyes. No man has seen God. No man can see thee face to face. They would be consumed in thy most holy presence. But we thank thee, O God, that we need a mediator. We need a day's man. We need a saviour and a redeemer. And we thank thee, O God, for thine appointed Messiah. We thank thee for the saviour of the world. We thank thee for thine only begotten, well-beloved Son. We praise thee for the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, the second person of the triune Jehovah God the only mediator between God and men. We come to thee in his name. We stand in his righteousness, accepted before thee. Bold I approach the eternal throne. Lord, clothed in the righteousness of Christ, we stand complete in him. We thank thee for his broken body and shed blood, for his finished work, the atoning sacrifice. We bless thee, Father, for that finished work. We thank thee for the sorrows and sufferings of one who shed his crimson, ruby, royal and redeeming blood that we might have peace with God, that our sins would be forgiven. And we thank thee, O God, that there is a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. At Calvary's cross is where we begin when we come as lost sinners to the Lord Jesus Christ. And we humbly pray, our Father, that thou would be pleased to receive of our worship as we come through thine only begotten Son and his merit and the value of his blood. We stand by blood alone, accepted before thee. And we thank thee for thy presence that we have felt through today, for help in the morning time for prayer. And then the gathering, O God, for worship, this afternoon in the open air, and the preaching forth of thy word, for the outreach that was done around the doors. And we just bless thee and praise thee for thy hand upon us for good. We thank thee for the gathering for the half hour of prayer, and now this gospel hour. And we rejoice, our Father, in the liberty that we have, the freedom, when we think, Lord, of the persecuted churches. We think, Lord, of countries where they don't have the same freedom that we have. Remember those that are in bonds. We've prayed for the persecuted church today. We've asked, Lord, for mercy and grace and help, and that they may enjoy the same freedoms that we have. We thank thee, O God, that the bulldozers are not at the door. We thank thee the padlocks are not on the gates. We bless thee, Lord. We are free to come to this house, to worship, to preach the gospel. We're free to go into the open air, to proclaim a living Savior, to dead sinners. We're free, O oh God, to give leaflets out and literature out, Lord, proclaiming the glorious gospel of thy grace. And we bless thee, our Father and God, that these are no small mercies from thee. And Lord, we pray that we might cherish them, that we might use them, that we might realize where these privileges abound. So does the responsibility to use them for thy glory. Help us not to miss an opportunity. Help us to sow the good seed, and whether in person or in prayer or in some practical way or through preaching, we pray, Lord, that the good seed of the word will be sown on good soil and will take root downward, bear fruit upward. We pray for the gifts of the Spirit in repentance unto life and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray for souls out of Christ without a Savior, some gathered in this meeting house tonight, others listening on the internet. We pray, O oh God, that far and wide, wherever there's a faithful man behind the sacred desk, preaching the whole counsel of God, uplifting the book and the blood, we pray you'll lay liberally to the charge of every ambassador 
ambassador of the cross and bring precious souls to know Christ, whom to know is life eternal. Continue with us now and not only here in Cumber, but across our province and nation and across this very earth. We pray you'll bless the faithful preaching of the everlasting gospel of thy grace. We pray for the lifting up of the bloodstained banner of the cross. We ask, O God, for the exaltation of Christ and the uplifting of the blood. And where the blood is exalted, we believe there's life and there's power. For we believe, O God, there's power in the blood. And we thank thee for the precious blood of Christ that washes away a lifetime of sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we pray, O God, that sinners will be led to that fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and they're plunged beneath that flood, Lord, will lose all their guilty stains. Lord, hear and answer prayer. And Father, in answer to our cry now, be pleased to glorify thy dear Son. Bless all who have gathered. You know the need of every heart and every home, those that are saved and those that are not. You know the problems that God's people are facing. You know the difficulties, Lord. You know the valley of tears. You know, Lord, the heart. And we just commend them lovingly to thee. And we pray for comfort. We pray for grace. We pray for help. We pray for encouragement. We ask, Lord, that in every way they will prove the sufficiency of God's grace. Remember our sister Ruth today. We pray, Lord, you'll be with her uh, as she has gone through surgery. We just commit her to thee and we just ask that you'll perfect that which concerns her. We pray, Lord, for Marcus and Lucas. We remember Albert and Elizabeth and uh, Ben, Benjamin. We just commend them all to thee and just pray, Lord, you will give healing and guide surgeons and give a full recovery and grant, O oh God, that all will go well and all will be well as we commit Ruth and the family to thee. So be with us now. And Father, lead us on and out with thyself in the Saviour's precious name we ask it and the people of God said. Amen. Let's turn again in our hymn books to 213, another great hymn, 213. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 5. Sorry, verses 1, 4, and 5. Verses 1, 4, and 5. 213, standing as we sing. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we worship.
ask our clerk of session, Mr. Jackie Allister, if he'll come forward, please. He's going to make some necessary announcements. Thank you. Well, good to see you all again out at the House of God. We do welcome you again in the Saviour's name. I do remember uh, during the holiday months, there's just two, two meetings really during the week. Uh, that's on Tuesday evening at 8 o'clock, our prayer meeting and time of Bible study. And then on Friday at 10 p.m., there's the men's prayer meeting. So keep those meetings in mind, please. Next Lord's Day, the service is as normal, half past 11, our morning service. Uh, and it is the last Lord's Day of the month, uh, so we will be meeting around the Lord's table uh, after the morning service next Lord's Day. Uh, then at 7 p.m., as we've been mentioning over the last couple of weeks, it is a, a special uh, service. Uh, the Apprentice Boys uh, of Londonderry will be uh, attending the service and parading to the service. Uh, uh, the service will be at 7 o'clock as usual, so do keep that a special service in mind, please. And then, of course, our open air will go ahead as usual at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. And our own minister, uh, the Reverend Martin, will be with us for those services next Lord's Day. Can I just mention again this evening the Loch Earn Fundamentalist Convention, which starts uh, next Sunday in our church in Enniskillen. Uh, it runs from next Sunday, the 31st of July, uh, right through to Sunday the 7th of August uh, and the meetings during the week uh, are at 8 p.m. Uh, during the weeknights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'd like to thank our clerk of session for making those announcements subject as always to the divine will of the Lord. Just before we come to the preaching of God's Word, 298, I think we have a tune that will be, I uh, will know it okay, 298, the, the hymn may not be familiar, but hopefully the tune will, we'll stand as we sing, but we'll sing all of the hymn now, it's very warm in the church, and I'm sure you can feel that, they do tell us, those who are experts, I don't know who gets paid to date all these uh, statistics and all these figures, but they tell us for every five people in a building, it's the equivalent of having a radiator on. Now, if you imagine we had all these radiators on, and then we added a few more, and then we took in some electric heaters as well, you would soon see how much heat is being generated here in the church. And then, of course, uh, you have glass either side and glass at the back as well. So there is the greenhouse effect, and uh, that's why it's so warm, and uh, we understand that. So if you can, and the uh, spring of your neck doesn't give way during the preaching, and uh, if you're going to fall asleep, if you could do it in the first minute of my preaching, because I haven't got to the boring stage by that time, and uh, you should be okay. But if you can, lengthen out your concentration span. Ask the Lord to help you, because I can tell you, it's very hard to beat the sleep. No matter who you are, uh, even Samson, uh, he was put to sleep on the lap of Delilah, and he couldn't beat the sleep. He was a strong man in every way, as we were looking at this morning, but he couldn't beat the sleep. So hopefully you'll be okay and uh, not be too warm. But if you do feel uncomfortable, I don't want you all leaving, by the way, <laughs> but if you do feel uncomfortable and you feel I'm about to faint, don't be afraid to get up and go out and get yourself some fresh air. Come back in again as well. Now, we don't want, you know, 60 people leaving all at the same time. Uh, but if you do feel, don't feel uncomfortable, please, in the building. And if you feel unwell or if you don't feel right, then feel free just to get up. You'll not annoy me one bit. You'll not disturb me one bit. And uh, don't you worry about embarrassment or anything like that. It is extremely warm and we do appreciate that. 298 then, and uh, we're standing as we sing. Sing all of the hymn, please. <clears throat> Let's all stop.
Let's turn to Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 13. I did mention this morning that it'd be good if you're reading the Bible, if you're doing your quad time, or if you're doing any study at all of Scripture, or even if you come to a chapter like this in the Bible, that it's always good to have a little chapter summary. And if you want a little chapter summary of Matthew 13, if you read it, uh, you'll realize that it's a chapter of parables. I always then link Luke chapter 13, which is the chapter of opportunity. You could literally write over Luke 13, the chapter of opportunity. Opportunity lengthened, opportunity limited, and then in the fall of Jerusalem, opportunity lost. It's a chapter of opportunity. I did say to you in number six today, uh, you have the Nazarite vow and the ironic blessing. You could summarize the chapter there. If you come to Matthew 13, then you do have all these parables. You could single out some of the more dominant ones, and you could then do a little summary of the chapter. And then when you're reading your Bible, you know what's coming. Or if you're witnessing to someone, or if you're talking to God's people, or if you're on conversation, uh, then you'll not have to fall as some do and say, you know, it says in the Bible somewhere, uh, but you don't know where it is. You don't know where it's the Old Testament or the New Testament. Dr. John Douglas, who was the principal of the Whitfield College of the Bible, uh, whenever the students uh, were sitting, they were waiting on him coming in for what they called exegesis, that is, in-depth study of the Bible. That's word for word. You take every single word and you study it. And uh, they were long classes, maybe two hours long, and then a half an hour application. I'm sure you remember them, Wendy, as the rest of us do. And uh, it was a very hard class because it was on a Thursday afternoon and you wanted to get away on home and some had a good distance to travel. But uh, he would have done exegesis and he would have literally applied the word of God to all of our hearts. It's a tremendous class. I remember that class so well. Uh, but uh, Dr. Douglas, whenever he was taking those classes, uh, he would summarize the Bible for us. He would give us the Bible chapters and he would then apply the word to our hearts and those Bible summaries, those chapters, those passages, we haven't forgotten them till this day. But he had always a little, uh, I would say he was jesting in many ways, but he would have come in and all the students were waiting. And all of a sudden he would say, I want you to turn to the book of Hezekiah. And all you heard was these Bible students flicking through their Bibles. And then they realized, uh-oh, there is no book of Hezekiah. No such book. And uh, they were searching. You could hear the pages uh, flicking through. And he goes, imagine future ministers, <laughs> missionaries, and you're looking for the book of Hezekiah. It's not there. You'll not find it. It's not there. And of course, it, it sounds like a book of the Bible, but it's not. So it's good to know your Bible and to know the books and know where things are in the Bible that you don't have to search. And we do have the lazy man search today. Uh, we do have Bible apps. We do have little search engines and you can find where it is, we know that. But when you're witnessing, it's good to have a thorough working knowledge of Holy Scripture. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We also have Mark chapter 4, Luke chapter 8, and those three chapters. Those three chapters all contain the parable of the sower. And not only the parable, but the explanation or the interpretation. So remember that you could literally put all those three chapters together and do a summary. The parable of the sower and other parables. And you have them all in those three chapters. Matthew 13, I would also link with Mark 4, and I would also link with Luke chapter 8. But we're in Matthew tonight, although we will make mention of Mark and of Luke's account of the parable of the sower. We've been looking at it now over the last three Sunday nights, and this is the fourth, which we'll be looking at the final thought, which is the good ground hearer. And uh, we trust the Lord will bless our hearts together. We're going to commence to read. We'll break in at the chapter, actually, at verse 18. And for the sake of time, verse 18, Matthew chapter 13. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that heareth the word, and anon or immediately, with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. 
He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Amen. We'll end our reading there to verse 23. And we know the Lord will indeed bless the public reading of his own precious and infallible word. Father in heaven, we thank thee for worship. We thank thee for a sense of thy presence. And as we come to close out the Lord's day, evening and the preaching of the old evangel, grant, Lord, that there'll be an hearing ear and an understanding heart. We pray there'll be a ready hand and mind to receive the engrafted word that's able to save the soul. We pray, Father, to this end that you will be pleased to be with us. We know it's warm and the day is far spent. The night is at hand. Lord, we're like the two in the road to Emmaus. We say, abide with us, tarry with us, Lord. Let thy presence intensify superintend this final meeting of today and grant O oh God you will prepare hearts for the preaching of the gospel of Christ and Lord may hearts be prepared as good ground for the sowing of the good seed so to this end Father bless preacher and hearer alike encourage us through the ministry of thy word give to me now thy servant cleansing afresh through the precious blood of the Lamb. Forgive me my sins and wash me, O Lamb of God. Wash me from sin by thine atoning blood, Lord, make me clean within. Grant to me now not only cleansing and healing through the blood, but the infilling of thy Holy Spirit. I pray for wisdom and power to handle the word of life. I pray, O God, you will break thou the bread of life to us tonight. And loving Father, in answer now to prayer, save the lost, restore the backslidden, Revive the church. Glorify thy son. We ask these things in our Saviour's precious name. Amen. In our last three studies on the parable of the sower, we notice that firstly, the first soil or condition of heart was hard. It was trodden down ground, which could not yield fruit because it naturally rejected the word of the Lord. In other words, it failed to respond positively to the preaching of the gospel. It failed to receive the word deep into the soil or into the heart. It's called the wayside hearer, the heart that naturally rejects and repels every offer of the gospel and spurns the mercy of God in Christ Jesus. And they do so naturally. That is the condition of the natural heart in Adam in our fall. We naturally repel the invitations of the gospel and the sowing of the good seed. And therefore, that because it lies on the surface, the devil comes, the wicked one, or Satan, as all three Gospels gives those titles, and snatch away the good seed of, that word, of the word preached and sown, and that there's no fruit. And the second soil, or heart condition, was shallow soil. In other words, the good seed of the Gospel had no hope whatsoever of maturity. No hope of great growth because its roots could not penetrate the rock mass upon that which that little soil and shallow soil basically blown there by the wind as dust would gather in a gutter in your house and some little seed would fall and it would have a little bit of rain and it would germinate and then it would fizzle out or wither away. Such is the Soil that's sown on stony ground. And we know from studying of scripture that it's a rock mass. It's not just stony ground. Because the roots could make their way around the stones and find the moisture below. So it's a rock mass. You've got rock. And you'll find sometimes in the mountains that you'll see that dust is blown onto a rock mass. And there's little plants growing. But then when the sun comes up, they're withered away, fizzle out. And they die because they have no depth of earth. And no soil. The third soil was that which, or heart condition, was that which was full of seed thorns. I told you last Lord's Day evening that they were not huge thorns that were already grown. No thistles or briars that you would have literally thrown them into a hedge or among those thorns. No. In fact, the ground looked okay. The seed thorns were in the ground already. And when the good seed was there and it germinated there in that soil, those seed thorns grew up alongside. Here's the heart. 
Here's the heart that finds comfort in the gospel, that in a, in a measure responds to the truths of the gospel and acknowledges in a measure their need of a saviour, but they're unwilling to remove the seed thorns of sin. They're unwilling to leave their past. They're unwilling to face up to the truth that they're sinners and they need to leave their sin and separate from their sin. And those sins grow up alongside the profession of faith and suddenly because of persecution and opposition, they too fall away and bring no fruit unto perfection. However, the parable ends well, doesn't it? Because we have the good seed falling on good soil. In other words, the good seed fell upon good ground or an honest and good heart, as Luke tells us, an honest and a good heart, the seed falling. And it tells us that it brought forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some a hundredfold, and we see that in Christendom. We see that in the visible church. There are those who are all out for the Lord. There are those who would never miss a meeting. There are those who are at every meeting, and should the doors never be opened, they're going to be there. They're everywhere. They're doing everything for the Lord. They're outreach. They're going here, going there. They're helping out. They're offering a hand. They're doing everything. Some a hundred. Then there's some sixty. And then there's some thirty. But still, they bring forth fruit. And the Lord says these folks are saved and they're bringing forth fruit. What an encouragement that is to us to know that as we evangelize that there will be fruit for our labor. That seed will fall on good ground and it will bring forth. And we know that 25% of the harvest at least we will be reaping. And if you look at the parable and you study numbers in the Bible, you will discover that all the other grounds that didn't bring forth fruit, uh, the other grounds, uh, the good ground brings enough fruit that nothing's lost in the gospel. Nothing is lost in the gospel. So tonight, to finish our studies in the parable of the sower, we're going to look at the good ground hearer, or the honest and the good heart that brings forth fruit unto God. Repentance unto life, faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to consider first of all them that it is ground that is prepared. It is ground that is prepared. We thought about those other grounds, but this is different. This is ground that is well prepared for the sowing of the good seed. In other words, the conditions are right for the sowing of the gospel. In other words, unlike the other grounds and the other hearts, this soil was capable by preparation of the Holy Spirit of God to produce a bumper harvest. Mark's Gospel, chapter 4 and verse 20, as I told you, you have three accounts. John doesn't take the account of the parable of the sower, but Mark and Luke and Matthew do. But in Mark's account, we get another little detail that we don't have in Matthew's. And it tells us this, and these are they, that's the good ground. These are they that such as hear the word, and here's the word, and receive it. And they receive it. It's a different word that Mark uses because he's theologically teaching us something about the gospel and conversion. These are they that such as hear the word. They don't reject it. They don't fight against it. They don't argue against it. They don't resist it. They don't repel it. These are they that hear the word, but they receive it. They receive it into their heart and deep into their soul. And it's very interesting, and I'm not trying to be smart here. But that word receive means to admit or to allow something to come in. That's what it means. It's probably a poor illustration, but if someone came to your house and to visit with you, and you were there and you said to them that, uh, you just stand at the door. We're not admitting you. You're not welcome here. You just keep them at the door. That's probably the minister, by the way, when he calls unannounced. And you say, well, the house is not tidy. If you give me a phone call, I very rarely, if ever, call cold. I always ring. Gives you time to tidy your house. <laughs> and if you go into someone's house, as someone said to me one time, I heard it said, and in 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 someone was preaching, and the, the minister went in and said, you know, Look at the state of the house downstairs. And I tell you the truth, the man says, well, listen, I'm not worried about downstairs. It's up there I'm thinking about. Obviously, heaven, she says, is even worse upstairs. And that's exactly what we could say. But listen, it means that you don't keep them at the door. It means you open the door and you welcome them in. And they sit, you admit them in. That's what it literally means. What a beautiful picture we have of that word receive. It means that Christ is knocking at your heart's door tonight. He's standing and he's knocking and he's been knocking for a long time, hasn't he? 
And you know that from your earliest days, maybe from a mother's knee, you know from Sunday school and children's meetings, you know from gospel campaigns and missions, you know that the Savior, the one who died on the cross, the one who suffered and bled and died a substitutionary death, the one who agonized, the one who shed his life's blood, who offered to God a perfect sacrifice in the broken body and shed blood to put away sin, to turn away divine wrath. That's who's standing at your door. Those feet that are standing tonight are the feet that walk the lonely path to Calvary's cross. And there it was spiked to an old Roman gibbet and lifted up was he to die. Those hands that knock upon your heart's door are the hands, those hands that touch the leper that touched the dead and raised them up, that touched the eyes of the blind and those that were deaf, the hands that were spiked to the tree, or the hands that knock at your heart's door, the one who stands as the saviour of sinners. Oh, listen, you may have admitted others, the world, the flesh, the devil, sinful pleasure, all were welcome, but no room in your heart for Christ, the crucified. He stands at your heart's door. That's a beautiful word, that word, and receive it. It's a picture of Christ being accepted and welcomed into your heart and into your life. He's not kept out. There's no padlock on the door. There's no bar, no chain. There's no lock. It simply means to admit or allow, allow in. That's what it literally means, to invite, to come in, to receive without fear and without rejecting. It means to readily accept. That is, there's no question about it. You're willing, you're ready to receive the Lord. That's the good ground. I want to tell you it means literally to delight in. It's another meaning of this word. So think of it. Here's the picture. You readily receive and delight to do it. Christ into your heart. I heard someone testifying one time and they said, and they lived a wild life and they, they were standing to testify and I had a little laugh to myself. It always stayed with me. And he says, you know, I thought the Christian life was boring. I thought to be a Christian means that you have no joy, no happiness. And here's what he said. And that night that I was coming to the Lord, it was in my mind, have your last smile before you come to the Lord. But this word means to delight in. It means that when Christ comes in, you delight to welcome him in. There's no reservation here. There's no question mark over what will happen. You're willing to receive. You're ready to accept. You're prepared now for Christ to come in to your heart. The conditions are right on this soil. In other words, there's no resistance to the truth anymore. In fact, there's no rejection of the gospel anymore. There is no literally turning away from the Lord, but rather there's a reception of Christ as your Savior. You accept Him. You receive Him into your heart and into your life as your own and personal Savior. That's the ground we're talking about here. Those good ground hearers or those who have are here with an honest and good heart are those who willingly and gladly receive the good seed of the gospel. They don't question you see, the Lord said, except you become as little children. And little children will accept a lot of things, you know. When my boys were young, I was the greatest person in the world. I could have told them anything. I could have told them I'm the strongest man in the world. And they would have believed it. But that would have been a lie. I could have told them there's no more beautiful person in this world than me. But they had enough sense to know that's a lie. I could have told them everything about me. I remember my father telling me stories about himself and not one of them were true. Not one of them. And some of the things he did tell me, as some of his friends says, well, I remember that. And they told me the different story. They told me a different story. But it is true. Children will accept anything you say to them at times. There was a young fella. He was in school and he was learning to count. And the teacher was taking him through from one to ten then from 10 to 20. And when the young person got, or that young child got from 20 to 30, he got something like this, uh, 26, 27, 28, 29, 2010. And, and, and he went home and the mother was, sorry, it was the mother teaching him and he kept saying 2010, 2010. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't say 30. Brought him into the school and the teacher says, now what's your problem? 
And he says, 26, 27, 28, 29, 20, 10. And the teacher says, no, 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 no. 30. Just like that. That young fellow said, 30. And to this day, he can count past 30. I know him really well. He's not here tonight, by the way. But you can understand, children are readily accept things. They do. And the Lord says, except you become as little children. You shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Little children accept. And that's how it's good ground. It's an honest and a good heart. It doesn't repel. In other words, they delight in it rather than despise it. In other words, they accept it rather than reject it. That's the good ground. Luke's account adds another little detail. And it says they have an honest and a good heart. They have an honest and a good heart. That's not a natural thing because we're sinners. And our hearts are not honest and our hearts are not good. But we're talking about ground that's prepared. The Holy Ghost has prepared this ground and made it ready to accept the good seed of the gospel. To accept the truths concerning the sin and judgment and hell. And how to get to heaven through faith in Christ alone. In other words, they accept the truth of the gospel. There's no resistance how often you have witnessed to individuals and you know that they are wayside hearers or else they're, they're individuals who really are unwilling to give up on their sin and they're thorny ground hearers. You know that. And you're witnessing to them and they say, well, I'm not a sinner. I don't believe I'm as bad as other people. I don't believe for one moment that God would ever put me out of heaven. Is he not a God of love? And you're preaching judgment and you're preaching on sin. And I don't see myself as a sinner. And then they go on and they say, well, I've never killed anybody. So killing someone makes you a sinner. No, it doesn't. It just shows you how wicked your heart is. And that you're already a sinner. That you would actually do that. I want to tell you they readily accept the truth of the gospel. In other words, they accept without doubt that they're sinners. They accept that they're lost and they're undone. They believe without question, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. They believe that the Bible puts a circle around us all, and it's all inclusive, for there's no difference. There's not a just man or woman upon God's earth. There's no man or woman that sinneth not. And the Bible tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God and they believe it. Now tell me, do you believe that? Do you really believe that you're a sinner? Do you believe that you're lost and undone? Do you now believe that if you died right this moment, you would be in God's hell? Do you believe that? You may believe that. And many people in this province believe that. I've witnessed to individuals and they would concur with that statement. But there's something just keeps them back. You see, they're thorny ground hearers. They're unwilling to give up the seed thorns of sin. They're unwilling to face up to their past. Unwilling to confess their sin. Afraid to admit their guilt before a holy God. But they'll give a little mental assent. Yes, that's true. We're all sinners. There's nobody perfect. But they won't apply it to themselves. But the thorny ground hearer, or the good ground hearer does, they accept readily, yes, I am a sinner. But more than that, they accept as well that they cannot save themselves. They might see themselves as sinners, and there are people who do. And they say, you know, I might be a sinner, and I know that, and I know that I've offended God, and my sin is an offense to God, but I want to tell you something. I've been baptized. I met a person recently, and listen, people might even say to us, why do you mention baptism and confirmation will not save you? Sure, there's nobody in your church, and there's nobody in evangelical circles believe that, but can I tell you something? How do we know that? I met a person not so long ago, and they actually said about baptism and confirmation. And that made me more adamant. That nearly every sermon I will preach, I will say to you, your baptism or your confirmation will never get you to heaven. Not only are you a sinner, and don't take offense at that because that's what God says, and I'm a sinner as well. But you cannot save yourself. You cannot save yourself. You cannot offer to God anything that would pay for your sin. There's nothing that you have. There's nothing you have done that you're doing or will ever do. That could make amends for the offense of your sin. It has to be paid for. And it will be paid for. Either on the soul of the sinner. In hell for all eternity. Or else on the body of God's dear son. The sacrifice. The sin bearer. Vicariously. 
the vicar, that is, the mediator, that is, the saviour and the sin-bearer. I want to tell you that not only will you admit that you're a sinner, this is hard that's prepared, but you will also acknowledge, I cannot save myself. There's nothing in me, and there's nothing in my church, and there's nothing in religion that can do my soul any good, more or less bring me to heaven. You've got to believe that you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and that not of works, lest any man should boast. The good ground hearer will not only believe and accept readily that they're sinners, and that they cannot save themselves, but they will believe with all of their heart that only Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming into this world as a true man, living a sinlessly perfect life, and then dying a substitutionary death on the cross, taking the guilty place of the sinner. Only Christ alone can save your soul. A great verse there in John chapter 3, 16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God commendeth his love toward us in Romans 5 and 8. And that while we were yet sinners, we admit we're sinners, Christ died for us. And they will believe that. And more than that, they will do more than that. Because there are maybe people present here tonight, and you're not saved, and you believe that you're a sinner and you believe you cannot save yourself and you actually believe that Christ alone can save you and you believe that and you don't believe that your church or your baptism or your good works could ever get you to heaven and you know it but you're still not saved. In other words, the good ground here is someone who's willing, knowing all that, they're willing to obey the commands of the gospel and that is to repent of their sin and to believe and receive into their heart Christ as their own and personal saviour. God commandeth now all men everywhere to repent. They obey that command. But as many as received him, to them give he power to become the sons of God. That is to be redeemed and saved and converted to Christ. To them that received and to them that believe. And to them that repent. Do you see? The ground is prepared. i never forget one conversion in particular. I'd finished preaching. We were praying for an individual in meetings. She was in that night. I remember finishing the message. And pronouncing the benediction. I remember leaving the pulpit. I left it this side. It wasn't in Cumber. I left it this side. And I walked down the aisle. And just right at the back, just right at the back where Frank Cork is sitting now, right at the back, as I came down, as I reached that seat, this woman bounced up out of her seat, scared me, bounced up out of her seat and grabbed me by the arm. And the, the grip that that woman had on my arm, I wasn't for getting away. And she said, and I could feel her hands shaking and my body shaking with it. And she said to me, Reverend Martin, Reverend Martin, I need to get saved now. Right now, I need to get saved. And I cleared one of the ante rooms in the church. And I brought her in. And I sat down with her. I want to tell you, I did not need to go over the gospel. She knew it. I didn't need, although I did go over it. I didn't need to tell her she was a sinner. She knew it. I didn't need to tell her she couldn't save herself. She knew it. I didn't need to tell her that Christ alone could save her and he has done so when he suffered, bled and died and rose again at the cross. I didn't need to tell her that what she needs to do now is repent and believe. She knew what she needed to do. I never seen a girl tremble and cry as much in my life and she wept her way to the Lord. I made a phone call this afternoon. I made an inquiry about her, her husband and family. And I got good news to say all, all those years ago, she's still going on with the Lord. A good ground hearer. And the least the preacher and the flesh has to do with it, the better. The better. The better. Because it's the work of the Holy Spirit. And at last, I think someone did say to W.P. Nicholson, I think it was him, I saw one of your converts recently in the pub. And he says, you're right, it was one of mine. But you see the Lord's, they don't go in there. <laughs> How true that is. How true that is. And I say this with love to you and to this congregation. We're better having no professions than false ones. 
We're better not plucking fruit until it's ripe than plucking unripe fruit and destroying the harvest. We're better to wait on God to prepare the ground. Now, I wonder tonight, do you have an honest and a good heart? In other words, are you willing now to repent of your sin? I'm asking you, are you willing right now to leave your sin and to receive Christ as your own and your personal Savior? Are you willing to repent and believe and accept Christ into your heart and into your life? Are you a good ground hearer? Has the seed tonight fallen on good soil? And are you ready and prepared to take the Lord into your heart? It's not only ground that's prepared, but notice secondly, it's ground that is perceptive. Over in Matthew's, or sorry, Matthew's gospel here, in the verse 23, it says, He heareth the word and understandeth it. Now that's a remarkable thing. He understandeth it. You remember when Philip was taken away from the city of Samaria? He was taken in Acts chapter 8. Again, a chapter summary summary there. You have the conversion of the Ethiopian and the opening of the gospel, by the way, to the African nations. A fulfillment of Psalm, I think it's 68, whereby it was says that Ethiopia shall reach out her hands unto thee. When did that happen? That's a prophecy in the Psalm. Ethiopia shall reach out her hands unto thee. When did that happen? I tell you when it happened, I believe, in Acts chapter 8, whenever the Ethiopian eunuch was pointed to Christ. And he went back and he brought the gospel to Africa. And those African nations today owe the gospel, liberty, and freedoms to Acts chapter 8, the Ethiopian eunuch. It's a very poignant point to make. It's a very interesting chapter. It's a pivotal chapter in the gospel among the nations and the fulfillment of the Great Commission is Acts chapter 8. But it was there that the Ethiopian eunuch was converted to Christ. But you remember when Philip came alongside his chariot, he said these words. He found him that he was reading the book of Isaiah, the prophecy of Isaiah. But he was reading chapter 53. And he said to Philip, of whom is the prophet speaking? Is he speaking of himself as the sufferer and the Savior? Or is he speaking of another? And Philip had already asked him the question, Understandeth what thou readest? I was in an inquiry room after an evangelist. We had an evangelist with us in the meetings. And he was preaching the gospel. And this person came into the inquiry room. And I was alongside. The, it was actually Dr. Alan Kearns. And as we walked in, he was counseling this individual. And I never forget the way he did it. He said to that person, he says, Do you understand? Do you understand the gospel? Do you understand what you're doing? Do you understand? And he named all those things that he should understand. And you could see that the person was struggling to understand. I remember in some children's missions that we had, a children's worker was preaching. And and in some ways we, we felt uncomfortable, very uncomfortable in those meetings. I did anyway. And I felt extremely uncomfortable with the counseling of those little ones. So much so that I went alongside. And I could see because I went alongside those children and I said to them these words. Now tell me this. Why did you stay behind? And they told me. Here's what they said. I stayed behind because they said if you want to stay behind you can. I stayed behind because he stayed behind and I just followed him. But those children were being pointed to the Lord but they didn't understand. They did not fully understand And it's vital that you understand. In other words, the Bible says, The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them, because they're foolishness unto him. In other words, they're spiritually discerned. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom, listen to this, the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them that believe not, lest... The light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. In other words, a reference to Isaiah as well, that they should be saved. In other words, we're seeing here, they're individuals and they don't understand the gospel. They really don't grasp it. But the good ground hearer is someone who not only receives and is willing to receive, it's because they fully understand what they're doing. They're not coerced. They're not forced. They're not literally bribed into a profession. 
Oh no. They're not shut into a corner and buttonholed. No. They understand what they're doing. They know full well what they're doing. My friend. If you know that you are a sinner tonight, if you know that you're lost and undone, and because of your sin, that you are on your way to a lost eternity in hell, the Spirit of God has revealed that to you. Not Thomas Martin. Not the session of Cumber Free Church. Not the praying people we have in this congregation. It's the Spirit of God that has revealed that to you. Now what the Lord said to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon, Flesh and blood hath not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. The Spirit of God has revealed that to you. Now you're privileged that the Spirit of God would reveal that truth to you. There are many who reject that, the wayside hearer. There are many who don't believe that. But you do. And the Spirit of God has revealed it to you. Now if you understand that Christ is your only hope of salvation, and that you can only be saved from sin, death, and eternal hell, By looking by faith to Christ alone and his finished work and shed blood. Now if you realize that God will only accept you. Pardon, save, forgive. And bring you to heaven and give you eternal life. On the ground and merit only what Christ has done on the cross. And if you're now willing to repent of your sin and receive Christ as your savior. I want to tell you. The spirit of God has taught you that. The spirit of God has told you that. The spirit of God has revealed that to you. The spirit of God has prepared your heart. But there's something missing, isn't there? You haven't come to Christ. You haven't yet received the Lord. Why not? Why haven't you come to Christ? I saw that in Scripture. Greatly challenged me in my daily readings. Where the Lord began to reason with his people and he says, Why have you done this? And I meditated upon that. And I thought, How the Lord reasons. Even in Isaiah, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Why are you not saved? These are important questions. I'm asked, and my session will verify this. I'm asked at our presbytery when Cumber is being interviewed and examined by our presbytery. I am asked, and our elders will concur. In fact, if I'm right in saying this, the clerk of session, which is our brother Jackie Allister, he has given the microphone, not to sing, <laughs> he's to given, and the question is this Do you concur? Were the answers given by your minister? One of those questions is this. Do you faithfully preach the gospel? Ah, more than that. Do you apply it to the conscience of those who hear? And there's a world of difference in preaching the facts of the gospel and applying it to the conscience. Appealing to logic. Gospel persuasion. It goes like this. Why? If you know you're a sinner, why, if you know there's a hell, why are you not saved? Why haven't you come to Christ when you know the only way to heaven is through faith in Christ? Why are you still in your sin? Why would you linger? Why would you not come? When the Holy Ghost has revealed it to you, when the Bible says, listen to it, my spirit shall not always strive with man. We had an email from an individual on Facebook a few weeks ago and stating clearly that traveling down, well, The email was he needed some spiritual counsel. Come round to the manse. It goes like this. The man was saved over eight years ago, but a couple of years he's been away from the Lord and he's lost the assurance of salvation. And he believed he was lost. He really believed it. And he says, you know, there was a message you preached and you mentioned a text of scripture and I trembled. I couldn't get it in my head. My spirit shall not always strive with man. My spirit shall not always strive with man. You see, friend, you can know all these things. You can be taught of the Lord. The Lord could be preparing your heart for the sowing of the good seed. But there is a limit. The 31st of July, 1983, I remember it well. I was in Her Majesty's Hotel. And I was there. I was in my cell. And that night, unknown to me, my brother David, who was about five cells up from me, sharing it with what they call a dorm. That is, there were four men in that cell. There were two men in mine. Four men. One Christian said to my brother David, David, you know you need to be saved today. You need to be saved tonight. Because the Bible says my spirit shall not always strive with man. David went into that four-man dorm. And they were literally, 
uh, taking tea and they were listening to the radio and they were chatting and they were talking about different things and David was lying on the bunk bed and he was lying on the top bunk and he really wanted those men to get to sleep and they wouldn't. And when they did go into bed and the lights were out by the prison officers at 11 o'clock, he wanted to get out of that top bunk and get down on his knees but he was afraid. He was afraid that they would stop him and they most likely would. Lying in that bunk bed, he tells the story himself. He says, those words of that believer, David, tonight is the night you must get saved. He trembled. My spirit shall not always strive with man. And he felt that night, that night was the last opportunity. And if he missed it, it was over. This is the night. Tonight is the night that you need to get saved. Not to know, your, you know that you need saved, but to be saved. To come to Christ, accept the Savior. Can I say, not only is it prepared ground, and uh, it is perceptive ground, but finally it is productive ground. You notice there in Luke 8 and 15, well, you don't have it before you, but it says on the good ground they are, who with an honest and a good heart. Now, honesty and goodness are qualities that because of the fallen atom of mankind, they do not possess those qualities today. In a measure, they may have them. They may be honest and keep their word. Uh, they may even be good and help you out. We know that. But as far as meriting favor with God and standing before God, not one of us are honest and good before God. The kind of honesty and goodness, it has to do with a sinner being honest with himself. It has to do with a sinner literally benefiting good from hearing the gospel. Being honest before the Lord about your sin. It's an offense to God and you have nothing to offer God. But God so loved the world. He gave his son and Christ came. You had nothing to give and Christ gave himself. You had nothing to offer and Christ offered himself. You had nothing that you could present to God. And Christ presented himself an offering for your sin and mine. He shed his blood. He suffered. He died for your sin and mine. And we've got to be honest before God tonight if we are good ground hearers. And we've got to realize not only our sinful condition, but acknowledge our total inability to earn favor or merit with God and to look now outside of ourselves and our church and religion and look to Christ the only Savior, and look to the Lord, your only hope of heaven. I want to tell you again, this church cannot save you. And the fruit that you need to bring forth unto God are repentance unto life and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what is known as an honest and good heart that's prepared of the Lord. It not only accepts and receives the truth, but it keeps it. It's not what the Bible says. They keep it with patience in relation to the good ground or good heart or good soil hearer. I tell you, they persevere through every difficulty without turning away from Christ. They face every trial and every problem. And they honor Christ by staying true to him and his word. They're unable to say no to sin, self, and the devil, and the world, and temptation. They keep on a righteous path until they die or the Lord returns again. Because they are kept. They are kept by the power of God unto salvation. If some fear, I couldn't keep it. And you're right, you couldn't, but the Lord will keep you. If you entrust your soul to him. You give your heart and your life to him in repentance and faith and you accept him as your saviour and your Lord. He'll keep you. He'll look after you. He'll make sure that you will never perish and you will never drop into hell. I wonder what kind of hearer you are. I'm conscious that in October, or sorry, in August, God willing, that I will be off for four weeks. And all the years that I've been preaching I've always felt it's a very significant time in my ministry because, and I hope and pray this doesn't happen, I may never see some of you again. Four weeks is a long, long time. In fact, a day is a long, long time. You talk to some people, and one day changes the life forever. And I really do not know. And if God spurs us all in you, we may have only one more Sunday where I can preach the gospel to you. Now, others can do it as well. You can meet people on the street. I understand that. But as your pastor, as your minister, who has a genuine heart for you, I'm conscious. I'm very conscious that time's running out. And if I go away on holiday and you're still not saved, I cannot say for sure that I will see you again. I really can't say it. 
What kind of hearer are you? Wayside? Continually rejecting? Stony ground? Like, well, sure, you've made a profession when you were younger, but there's nothing there. It's withered away. Or maybe a thorny ground hearer, unwilling to deal with the seed thorns of sin that are growing alongside the truth of the gospel that you know and choking it every day and strangling it? Or are you good soil? Are you prepared to receive the Lord? Are you ready? Are you willing? Will you take Christ tonight? The Lord says as I finish, him that cometh to me, he'll in no wise cast out. What does that mean? He'll take you in. That's what it means. Whosoever, that means you, shall call upon the name of the Lord. How simple is that? Shall be saved. Now, if you need help tonight, if you say, preacher, I know what I need to do and it needs to be done tonight. Well, listen to me. I have all night to the early hours of the morning if necessary, and I don't believe it will require that, to take time and open the word of God and show you from the Bible how you can be saved. And be sure that your sins are forgiven. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we do thank thee for this series that we've been looking at in the parable of the sower. Lord, we believe you've led us to it. You've directed our paths. You've given us the help in preparation and in preaching. And now we leave the outcome with thee. We pray, O God, as we have preached in human weakness and insufficiency and felt our own inability. We pray now for the application of the word to the conscience by the spirit of the living God. We pray you'll awaken and arrest sinners on their downward course to a lost eternity. We pray you'll bring them through tonight. We pray, Lord, you'll bring sinners to Calvary, to the cross, to Christ, and save them by thy matchless, marvelous grace. Give to them, O God, as the good ground suggests, Lord, the willingness to receive the truth of the gospel again and to take Christ into their heart and into their life as their own and personal Savior. Those of us who are saved, may we leave this house tonight prayerfully and very carefully pondering the things we have heard. Take us to our homes in safety. Keep the unconverted behind that they may seek the Lord while he is to be found and call upon him while he is near. We offer this our prayer with thanksgiving and believing in our Savior's precious and most worthy name. Amen.